for now, one of well, one of the major definitions of calculus coming up today, and when I say major, it's right up there with limits and derivatives. The definition I want to give you is the definite integral. And we've seen the indefinite integral. And the indefinite integral is just a bunch of derivatives. I don't know why I say just. The indefinite integral of a function is the antiderivative. So, like the indefinite integral of x squared is one third x cubed plus c. So now we have the definite integral. And when you first see the definite integral, it's not going to be at all obvious why. I mean, it's not going to be at all obvious that the definite and indefinite integrals are related. They're going to look like these completely unrelated concepts, but we'll tie them together, I think, in the very next section. So say that we have a function and we are interested in finding the area under this function. We've talked about approximating this area now we're going to try to actually find it. We're going to try to turn our approximations into an exact value using the limit. So to do this, we take this interval, which is by a strong tradition, um, called the interval a comma b, and we'll break this interval into pieces. And at this point, we're just approximating it. We're just reminding ourselves of some old material because I know that that break kind of everything sort of goes away. And in each of these pieces, we select a point. And then we use that point to create rectangles. And we take the area of these rectangles and we add all of those areas up and that's an approximation of the area. In terms of our Tuesday lecture, which if you were here, I hope you took the time to review the material. This is a Riemann sum. The sum from zero to n of f of x sub i star delta x sub i. And as a quick gesture, maybe I shouldn't, but as a quick gesture to students who didn't watch any of the videos. So we've got
a rectangle. And these delta x sub i's are the lengths or the widths, I should say, of this interval. So it's the base of the rectangle. And then F of this value here, this value here is X sub one star. And F of X sub one star is the height of the rectangle. So F of X sub one star times delta X sub one is the area of the rectangle. And this summation here is saying that I'm taking all of these areas and I'm adding them up. So this is what we called a Riemann sum. And this Riemann sum is approximating the area under the curve. And now let's ask ourselves, how could we make how could we make this approximation be better? Oops. Let's use some more visible color anyway. So we've got, okay, the heck with it. Let's just not try to recreate that. We've got this curve. We've got this interval. We've cut this interval into pieces. We have created these rectangles. These rectangles, their area is approximating the area under the curve. How can we make this approximation better? And to answer that question, let's look at the places where this approximation is really letting us down. So for example, here, there is this very noticeable chunk that's included in our approximation, but which we don't want. By which I mean that it's in the rectangle, but it's not under the curve. So how can we take this big piece that we do have and do not want, and how can we make that smaller? Well, what if? We took this someday. I'm going to stop doing that. Not today, apparently. What if we took this little interval here and we cut it in two? So instead of having one big interval, we have two smaller intervals. And on each of these intervals, we selected a point and we created a rectangle, just like before. 
Well, now maybe. A rectangle was look like that. And the error that we had is now smaller than it was. So we still got these chunks that we don't want, but those chunks are smaller than the chunk we had before. And maybe we could make these chunks even smaller, smaller yet. If we took, say, this fret interval here and we cut it into two, and now we create two rectangles. Beautiful. Well, we've still got these little chunks that we don't want, but they're smaller than they were before. And similarly, if we look over here, here's this, this huge error. And the reason it's an error is that this is area under the curve. And that um, shaded region is area we want. It's area that's under the curve, but we're not getting it, right? We're only getting the area that's in the rectangle. So we're missing this entire region. And very similar to what we did over here, what if we said, okay, well, let's take this interval from here to here and let's cut it up. Maybe let's cut it into four pieces. And we use these pieces to create rectangles. Angles. And suddenly our error has shrunk. That big region that we wanted but didn't have has turned into this relatively small region. This error over here. This big region here is an error because it's, we don't want it. It's not the area under the curve, but it is included in the rectangle. Well, what if we took this first rectangle this first interval, I should say, and we cut it into smaller intervals. Then the error has radically decreased, right? Originally, we had this whole big region that we didn't want. Now, the region we have that we don't want has shrunk down to that. And if we took this and we turned it into a statement, an observation, let's say, the more intervals we use and the smaller
the interval was R, the better the Riemann sum becomes. And by better, I mean, okay, this Riemann sum is trying to accomplish something. It's trying to approximate the area under the curve. The more rectangles we use and the thinner the rectangles are, the better. The closer the Riemann sum comes to the area. And let's look at this word more. So the idea here is that as we have more and more intervals, the Riemann sum becomes better and better. And way back before we even looked at derivatives, we looked at the idea of taking a limit as n approaches infinity. So we can talk about this idea of having more and more rectangles in terms of taking a limit. And with that, this major definition. So we have an interval from A to B. We have a function f of x. And say that we divide A comma B into equal length intervals. So when we first defined the Riemann sum, we didn't have any requirement that the interval was be of equal length. And like if you look here, this is our Riemann sum. Here's an interval. Here's an interval. Clearly not of equal length. But suppose that they are. Suppose we decide to use intervals of equal events. Then we can create a Riemann sum. The sum from I equals zero to N of F of X sub I star times delta X sub I. And this Riemann sum simplifies of it all, right? We have, we have these delta X sub I. And that's the length of the ith interval. So the length of the first interval or the length of the third interval or whatever. But because we've said that all of the intervals are equal lengths, that can simplify into delta x. 
whatever that equal length is, we're calling it delta x. We take the limit, this n is the number of intervals that we have. We take the limit as n goes to infinity. And this limit is the definite integral. So I warned you ahead of time that um, the relationship between the definite and the indefinite integral was not immediately going to be apparent. We have, on the one hand, we have the antiderivatives. On the other hand, we have this hideous limit that's supposed to be the area under the curve. Be that as it may, even though it's not clear what the relationship between these things is, not only do they have similar names, they have similar notation. In fact, the only difference in notation between the definite and the indefinite integrals is that the definite integrals have the numbers A and B show up. The beginning of the interval shows up down there. The end of the interval shows up up there. And that is the definition of the definite integral. Um, it's a definition of the definite integral. Does anybody have questions? so far. I mean, certainly I have things to say about this, but does anybody know that they're confused or that they want me to explain something again? And let me just make a quick comment. Why equal length? Well, if you didn't have that restriction, you could have a situation like this. You've got a function from A to B. And you are using two rectangles angles to approximate the area under the curve. And this approximation is pretty bad. I mean, you've got this whole region that you don't want, and you're missing this whole region that you would do want. So you say, okay, let's make this approximation better. Let's take this first interval and let's cut it into pieces. Okay, let's make this approximation even better. Let's take this interval and let's cut it into pieces. Mm -hmm. 
okay, let's make this approximation better. Let's take this first interval and let's cut it into pieces. And as you keep doing this, I mean, your approximation is getting slightly better as you cut those intervals into smaller and smaller pieces. But you've just, I mean, you've got this massive error here and you're not dealing with it in any way. So if we just take, keep taking these first intervals and cutting them into pieces, the number of intervals is going to infinity, but our approximation is staying bad. And that's able to happen because we have this super long interval here compared to these short intervals here. So making these intervals be equal lengths is stopping this from happening. Making this interval be of equal length says, okay, yeah, fine. You can keep cutting that first interval into pieces, but as you do that, you're going to have to be cutting these other intervals into little pieces to test you. Um, there's an alternative death alternative way of defining the definite integral that doesn't require the pieces to be equal length. And we should at least look at that. So let's call this an alternative definition. We've still got this interval. We've still got this function. And we're still going to cut this interval into pieces. And mathematicians can will never say anything clearly if they can help it. So we've got a bit of technical language there. We say that we're partitioning the interval when we cut it into pieces. So let's say that all of these pieces, they don't have to be the same size, but, and then we have this kind of alien piece of, piece of notation. It looks like an absolute value, except instead of one absolute value, set of symbols, as it were, there are two little vertical lines. But that alien bit of notation is the length of the longest we still look at this Riemann sum. We're no longer assuming that these pieces are all equal length. So, sorry, not to D. Uh, 
So we've got those delta x sub i's back again. And we're going to take a limit. And this time we're going to take a limit as the length of the longest piece approaches is zero. Well, this is also the definite integral. This thing we did here with the longest pieces going to zero and the thing we did previously The thing we did previously with the equal sized pieces going to infinity is the same. And this definition is nice um, because you can't in the real world always control what your intervals are. Like a lot of real world integration is done with tables of data. You have a bunch of observations and you have a bunch of function values at those observations. And those observations are giving you your intervals and they are what they are and you can't control them. So it's no use whining if they're not all. So it is good to have this alternative definition that doesn't require them to be equal. And if that doesn't, we'll talk more about applications of the definite integral. Mostly that's going to be done in calculus too, but we will talk about applications at the end of this semester as well. For now, we have this definition. Um, Using this definition to try to find a definite integral is right out, though. I'm, I'm going to say that now. I mean, if you remember when we were using the definition of the derivative, the f of x plus h minus f of x over h, we did a bunch of problems where we used the definition to find the derivative. We're not going to do anything like that with the integral. Um, you need to know this definition, but we're not going to use it as an integral finding method. We're going to learn much better methods um, both this semester and next semester. Apropos of nothing, but notice that that integral sign looks a lot like an S. That is literally where the integral sign comes from. S stands for sum. You take a capital S, you stretch it a little, and you get the integral symbol. So if we're not going to use this definition to find integrals, what do we have to say about it? Well, we have a fair few things to say about it. Let's start. by looking at the relationship between the definite integral and the area. So that's how this all started, right? We said we want to find area under curves. And we said, okay, we can approximate them with these Riemann sums. 
And then we took the limit of the Riemann sums and we ended up with the definite integral was. Here's the thing though. When I was talking about area under curves, I said, okay, so we want to talk about the area under the curve. So let's assume that our function is above the x-axis. There is nothing in this definition that will break if the function is negative. So there is nothing in this definition itself that forces the function to be above the x-axis. We could take a function that looks like this, just as easily as we could take a function that looks like this. And we could take the definite integral of both of these functions. Well, the definite integral of this positive function is just the area under the curve. As I say, this is how this all started. We wanted to take positive functions. We wanted to find the area under the curves. We've done that, right? Or, I mean, I say we've done that. We don't actually know how to take these definite integrals, but in theory, we have done that. We know that the area under the curve is that ugly looking limit, even if in practice, we don't know how to find those limits yet. What about a non-positive function? What about a function that is sometimes positive and sometimes negative. Well, if we have such a function, the definite integral is called the weighted area. And let me, because I am about out of room on this frame, let me uh, look at this again on a fresh space. So we have the interval A to B. We have this function. I guess we called it G of X. It's sometimes positive and it's sometimes negative. And notice that every time this function crosses the curve, it cuts the um, sort of cuts the plane into pieces. So this region here where the function is positive creates that region of the plane. And this region here, where the function is negative, gives us that area. And then this region here, where the function is positive, 
gives us that. So we take the we take the area between the function and the x-axis. If the function is positive, that's the area below the curve. If the function is negative, that's the area above the curve. And we look at, we look at these areas. Call them area A, area B, and area C. Then what I mean when I say that the definite integral is the weighted area is that when the function is above the curve, so here in region A and here in region C, we're going to take those areas and we're going to add them. But when the function is below the curve, so in area B, we're going to take that region and we're going to subtract it. So in this case, A plus C minus B. Uh, when you get to the quizzes, let me see, I can't remember uh, very well what questions I asked you. I'll have to take a look. But I think you're going to use this idea to find some definite integrals. So like, if you ask, what's the integral from a to B of A to B is no good. The integral from zero to two of two X minus three. Let's not get sloppy. Um, we do not want to use that limit definition. We do not want to start messing around with Riemann sums and trying to take their limit. But what we can do here is say, okay, 2x minus 3 is just a straight line. We're going from zero to two. Um, we can find these areas geometrically because these are triangles. And the area of a triangle is just one half the base times the height. So in particular, where does this uh, region happen? Where does this curve intersect the x-axis? Well, at three halves. So this is negative three. This is positive one. Does everybody see where that's coming from, by the way? I'm just plugging zero in here to get negative three. And then I'm plugging two in here and four minus 
three years one. So this uh, triangle has a height of one. This triangle has a height of three. This triangle has a base of three halves. This triangle has a base of one half. And then I can find the area of these triangles. One half the base times the height gives this triangle an area of nine fourths, it's weighted negative. One half the base times the height gives this triangle an area of one fourth, it's weighted positive. So this area must be negative two. Examples like this are obviously very artificial. Um, they rely on having these nice straight lines. Um, if I want to give you your tests back, I'd better wrap this lecture up quick. We're not finished with this section. We'll finish it tomorrow, but question? Let's see. So um, the area of this triangle should be one half the base times the height. So yeah, nine fourths.